Culture Interrupted, produced by Cognitive Rise Productions. What is culture? How we observe and celebrate, how we care makes us a people, upholding traditions built from our morals and experiences and values that we all have in common. Culture is how we share in the experience of life. Culture is how we celebrate life. What is happening in the cannabis industry? What are the changes and effects being felt? With regulation upon us, it is imperative that innovators remain compelling in action towards the ultimate goal, which is moving into a realm of highest quality standards and guidelines focus on wellness, harmony, education. Culture Interrupted is honored to present Tim Blake. I'm Tim Blake. I'm grateful and honored for cannabis to be part of my life, for the healing aspects, the inspiration, uh, what it does for me across the board. It's, uh, it's involved in every aspect of my life. My relation to plant started when I was 14 years old. I'm 62. Uh, instead of being given Ritalin and some uh, you know, hyperactive drugs, I moved to cannabis. It saved me from all that. Uh, I've had an intimate relationship with it ever since. I started dealing uh, at 14 years old. Uh, so I've uh, been kind of a seasoned uh, an outlaw outside the law of de dealing cannabis for you know almost 50, 40, 50 years now, and uh, moved into production and uh, large-scale cannabis cultivation. Uh, do some big grows in the valleys in the San Joaquin Valley and up here. Moved up here permanently uh, when they started busting all the uh, big loads of Thai and Mexican and hash coming off the. Uh, off the coast and everybody moved into doing indoor and outdoor. I remember the day that happened and they came in and told me it was gonna happen and 12 months later they'd busted all the loads. So I kind of watched all that, moved up to Northern California, got this campground, got an idea we'd have a celebration of the fall harvest and a competition, started the Emo Cup 16 years ago. We sponsored the first sheriff's debates here in the country so I became an activist after realizing that we had to change the, uh, the legalization uh, issue. And so I've been heavily involved in that ever since, along with the Emerald Cup. I have a fully integrated set of companies from uh, genetics to cultivation to nurseries to manufacturing to product companies. So along with the event, uh, I'm pretty well versed in most of those. Still a novice trying to learn it all. And uh, I'm an evangelist for the medicinal side. You know, it's all medicinal, but I mean the heavy medicinal side due to uh, three rounds of metastasized bone cancer, some serious illnesses and using cannabis has changed my life, and so I really spend more of my time being an evangelist uh, for the medicinal side and the healing aspects than even the uh, adult use fun side. You know, so it's kind of where I'm at. I grew up really loving the county fairs that everybody goes to at the end of the uh, fall season and the smells of all the animals and the fruits and vegetables and just the, the joy of a friendly competition. And we thought that that's what we should be able to do with cannabis, that we had the right to gather as a culture, as a community, and celebrate the fall harvest and have a friendly competition. So we refused to stand down and we went for it and uh, I'm very proud and honored and uh, grateful we did. Culture is the, the real deal, it's the whole thing. Look at those county fairs, you're bringing together the community and the culture of the community to have a joyous celebration of what they produce and create. And that's what cannabis uh, culture is, you know. You look at the people up in these mountains, uh, the 60s and 70s, the alternative nature uh, of reality and people, how they were living, and all of a sudden they moved up into the Emerald Triangle to live that back to the land lifestyle. And of course they had to figure out how to fund themselves and cannabis uh, was, a, was the right way at the time. And so that merging of you know, the alternative spirit and lifestyle, the back to the landers, the naturalists, all coming in and growing cannabis really did a magical creation and evolution of a culture that you, you couldn't have ever hoped to have created, you know, an organic thing up here in the Emerald Triangle. And it really is very, very significant to how the plants rolled out. My uncle is 90 years old. Uh, he's the oldest reigning Catholic priest in the Bay Area. He's retired now. He's got Parkinson's and all kinds of other ailments, and he wasn't doing well. And I convinced my retired cousin and uncle cops and lawyers and whatnot to let him take CBD. And he uh, he's had all these illnesses, and it worked really well, but he wasn't inspired in, in a certain way, you know. And I said, let me give him a vape cartridge. It's not like a joint where he'll get too high. He can just get a nice little buzz. And, and they finally uh, acquiesced, and we gave it to Bill, and, and they sent me some pictures of him dancing in the uh, living room with his vape pen. Uh, and it was such a joyous thing to see this Roman Catholic priest who uh, 
I was getting such uh, inspiration and gratification, and so it's, it's really made me happy to see him, you know, at 90 years old, be so uh, inspired. You are listening to Culture Interrupted. The winner of the Cup's never been the highest THC. The man with the most awards, uh, you know, women win too, but the, the gentleman that has won the most awards is a guy named Derek, and, and he's part of this culture. He's like a gnome-like, angelic figure. He prays over his plants while he waters them by hand. And I tell people, if you really want to understand cannabis, and you really want to understand the interaction and the intimacy with it and who we are, you realize you're not going to win with the highest THC and you're not going to win without the love of that. And that's there because of our culture and who we are and that, that man you know, lives organically and, and the way he's been raised. And, and you don't see that. You're going to go to a commercial farm in Salinas or Santa Barbara. You know, it's large-scale agriculture. It's timing. People are in a hurry. There's nobody praying over plants. I'm not saying you can't grow a good cannabis and it can't be effective, but it's so important to the, the overall culture of who we are and what we bring forth and the passion we have for genetics, looking for those expressions and stuff that people have spent so much time on. And, uh, you know, when you're risking your life back in the day when you're risking 20 years in prison, you're doing it because you're passionate. You're not trying to just make a buck. It's because you're really passionate about it. You won't stand down and you bring that in there. So the combined elements of these natural organic people living up here, outlaws that refuse to stand down and the passion for that and what we brought in and you know we created this culture that's so magnificent and so special that uh, you know it's sad to see it being torn apart now through the legalization efforts which and I supported. You know? I got tired of watching my friends do long time in prison. Uh, I have PTSD because I faced a couple you know, long prison terms. Uh, I, I uh, send letters of money to people with long-term prison sentences, and I watch the horror of their lives. I watch patients like my uncle Bill not have access to medicine, not feel comfortable using that medicine. And after I healed myself with using cannabis from stage, uh, not stage four, but metastasized bone cancers and serious, you know, immune issues, I realized that, you know, we've got to make this comfortable for the elderly, for the, the kids, for women, for everybody to use that without being demonized and, and get the relief and the inspiration they need. Uh, and I just was like, it's got to stop. And if it means we don't make money, if it means that it's going to make us suffer up here in the triangle, which it has, uh, and I've told people, I, I knew that going in, that that was going to be a price we were going to have to pay because now we've got cannabis going across the country, going across the world, taking it over. And I really believe that the California legalization was the final straw over the top of that roller coaster that did that. And I'm proud for all of us we did, even though there's been a tremendous fallout from that. 64 is a really tough one. Uh, I advocated for it. I did from the stage of the Emerald Cup. There's a lot of farmers that rightfully were against that, a lot of product makers, a lot of people that were very concerned and rightfully concerned. Because of those reasons I'd stated before about the need to get medicine to uh, everyday people, to get people out of prison, to stop that, you know, I went ahead with 64. I was promised, we were promised, there'd be no large-scale agriculture for five years. They'd stand down on that. That went away after two months of legalization. They said they'd protect the small farmers and protect the small product makers, and then they turned around and made all the product makers go to large-scale manufacturers to be able to create their products that they've been doing in their homes for 40 years because they don't trust us. It's all about trust. So instead of giving the small product makers and the cultivators a chance to slowly run their careers out. They're facing a demise overnight within a year. Most of these people are now going under because they're fighting against large-scale agriculture in Salinas and in Santa Barbara. They're looking at manufacturers that have wherewithal that they can't compete with. And I've gone to the VCC meetings and I've lobbied. And even though I have a manufacturing license and a manufacturing plant, I said, I don't want to make those people have to come to me so I can make more money off them. They should be able to do it at their homes. They, they fought for 20 years to do this illegally and you're taking it away from them. And so as much as I've tried to not be disparaging of the VCC and the state, uh, I think that overall we were snookered. Uh, I don't think that they've uh, done what they've said they would do. Uh, you know, and it's sad. You've got two divergent elements going on. You have this, this dying Emerald Triangle in the rest of the hills and the backwoods of, of California and at the same time, you got this new universe exploding with these galaxies and stars and planets. So it's a really tough thing, because on the one side, I'm so excited about all the, the growth that's coming in and all the acceptance and all the wonderful parts of what I wanted for 64. But they, we really owed it to the people that created this industry to not screw them. And that's what they did. And uh, I face that every day with people questioning why I did 64 and, 
and with them feeling like this was going to happen and, and uh, how it rolled out. So, uh, you know, I'd give them a D. I'd give the BCC and the state a D for how they dealt with this. Prop 64 evolved out of, uh, you know, C8 reform people. It, you know, came out of Richard Lee's. You know, it's, it's all an evolution of what happened. And what happens in politics, because I, you know, we started with the sheriff's debates here 12 years ago, the first place in the country that we brought the sheriffs together, the candidates to be before cannabis farmers. And uh, you realize that politics are about compromise. And before you realize or know it, you've compromised so much, you're not on the left or the right, you're in the middle. But, you know, sometimes you can't do that. And, uh, you know, we've compromised so much with this proposition. You know, the leagues of the sheriffs and political people got in and they decided that every city and county should have their own right to how they want to run it. And it's like, come on, you can't have different laws for every county in the state. You have the California state law and the counties live with that. It's not a different county for liquor or, you know, at all. And so how did you get that, you know? And how did they restrict all these things? And how did they... And so it became a compromise bill that's like, let's... Let's get this thing done because it's a start. And so that's true, that's what we did. And they are correcting a lot of that. But in that, there was a lot of compromise I wouldn't have agreed with. Um, and it's sad to see some of that. And uh, I'm glad that we're really working hard to rectify that because uh, you know, half, the, half the counties in the state don't even have uh, approval of cannabis in their, in their cities or counties. You know, and that's ridiculous. We voted for it. The voters of this state voted for it. They don't have any rights. How do politicians or government people choose? wrong. Before Colorado and before Washington or any of that, there was Mendocino County and we were taking everybody on. And from that, we created a program after we got our sheriff voted in called the 9.31 program where you could grow up to 99 plants with a sheriff's permit in the full sun because up until that time, people wouldn't buy outdoor because it was all growing in the shade, hiding from the choppers and stuff. So now you grow in the full sun. And we brought in almost a million dollars to that sheriff's department and saved a lot of jobs and saved a lot of money for the county. The feds came in and busted that program. And they came in the next year and shut it down. And Tom Allman had a press conference where he said, I don't understand. These people are paying into my sheriff's department. I've got large scale video of cartel grows and you're busting us instead. And they said, yes, and if you give one more permit, we'll arrest your district attorney, your county councils, your supervisors, and take you all to prison. And then they got to see who the feds really were. So we started out advocating, I started out advocating when Pebbles Trippett, who's an infamous female advocate for cannabis going way back, she got herself arrested about 15 years ago just to prove that you had the right to transport medicinal cannabis in your car, because how could you have medicinal cannabis and not transport it in your car? She went to jail for over a year for that. And she came to me, and she was the head of MAB, which was the Marijuana uh, Advisory Board. And she said, well, you sponsor the sheriff's debates at Area 101. You're right at the heart of the Animal Triangle. You're an outlaw. They, they trust you. And uh, I thought, you know, I got family that are, that are cops. My dad was a lawyer. Um, I was like, you know what? You know, I got brother-in-law's cops. Cops aren't all bad. I told people, I said, you know what? The first place you're going to call when you're getting robbed, it's not going to be your friend. It's going to be a cop. So it's time for us to stop this nonsense. There's good cops. There's bad cops. There's good cannabis people. There's bad cannabis people. We're all people. And so it's time to end that. And so Pebbles came and asked me that, and I just said, it's time. And so that's what started it. And uh, even though they busted that program and shut us down and we had to go hide, I really believe that was the impetus for Colorado and Washington to move forward with legalization. You are listening to Culture Interrupted. Uh, the reason why the Emerald Cup has integrity, the reason why people respect the Emerald Cup is because uh, I did the show here for the first uh, 10 years. I didn't even have any vendors or sponsors. I was the Neil Young element. He used to say that they t toxified the show. Now we all realize you need them and stuff, but I didn't have any vendors or sponsors. Uh, I just took out of my own pocket to pay for the show, try to get back what I could. Uh, I do an all organic show. We have to pay twenty to 30000 for a food buyout at the fairgrounds so they don't bring their Twinkies and hoes in. So it's all organic food. The cup's always been organic. My companies are organic. It's expensive. You don't make money. Uh, we poured everything into the show. I didn't even make money on that show for 12 years. People thought I was making bank, and I still don't make much money on it. It's, a, it's, an, it's an art piece for me. It's a work of love and a, you know, uh, for, the, for the community. So I've never gone for the money, and when I started going for the legalization, I was out in front, so I couldn't grow large uh, crops anymore. I couldn't hardly grow at all. And because of the Emerald Cotton making, not making money and me being an advocate, I really gave up the money. So it, it's never about money for me. You know, you're not going to get to heaven making money. You're not going to take anything with you when you leave here. It's about the 
the community service, the goodwill, the healing and inspiration you provide to your fellow men and women on this planet. So that's, that's not about money. A friend of mine came to me, my father's best friend, uh, and he said, you know, Tim, I've been watching you, and I realized you don't make any money on the Emerald Cup, and you're an advocate, so I know you're broke. Uh, people think you're rich. We've got to make some products and make you some money. And I thought, that's kind of weird. People are going to think that I'm, like, I'm the event. I, I can't do that. And we talked to a bunch of people, and they were like, no, we know who you are, and we know you don't make money, so it's like we're okay kind of making space for you. And so we started looking into what we could do, and it was going to be edibles, but then we realized it was all going to be oils and extracts. That was those years ago. So uh, we started looking for unique uh, profiles, terpenes, back then, four, four or five years ago. Uh, my guy started working on the genetics. We started bringing those, uh, those cultivars out, and uh, we started winning awards. And so we started seeing what we could do. And so I've got permitted cultivation sites, and then we did the genetics. And then the natural extension was to get a nursery, and then we got a manufacturing plant. Uh, this all came after we'd already started a series of products, Emerald Cup Concentrates, which have won a lot of awards uh, at uh, Chalice, Super Sesh, whatnot. And uh, people realized that we were pretty good at what we did. And uh, we sold 550,000 cartridges through Canacraft and Absolute Extract two years ago uh, with our strains because they were unique profiles. So we have all the licenses. We're vertically integrated across the board. Uh, and uh, we've gone through all the challenges and the pain and suffering and the financial distress that everybody else has trying to get those permits and stand up to them and get them done. It has not been easy. Uh, it's been the most challenging couple of years of my life. Uh, I've never had such a hard uh, financial day-to-day -day struggle to just make it with all these permits and the one thing after another they lay on you. So we've got them all though. We do them all. It's going to be really tough for people the Emerald Triangle and people that have built this industry. If you're not a brand, if you're not really built to go out there and to the public and uh, you know, be a social media beast and go out there, uh, you're gonna have it tough. Uh, you got 25,000 approximate whatever farmers up in the Emerald Triangle up in these areas. You know, we're talking about 90% of them going away. So think about these towns, these small towns and stuff with 90% of the people not making money anymore. The markets in town have already lost 50% of their business in two years. They're going to lose another 30%. We're going to lose a lot of them. Now, some places, southern Mendo County, Ukiah, and Willits that have uh, vineyards and other types of you know, economics to go with it are okay. But the hardcore, you get up into Laytonville, up through southern Humboldt, into the Triangle, uh, you know, they're going to have it very, very difficult. Uh, you're going to see a lot of that culture. It's already going away now. They're merging schools and things are happening. It's, it's phenomenal. But at the other side, like we talked about, you've got that demise happening, and then you've got this new universe and galaxies opening up. And look what's happening with Coca-Cola, with, you know, Carl's Jr.'s coming in. You know, you look at all this stuff happening. It's going so fast, Constellation getting rid of their liquor division so they can go all, all in on cannabis. And Steven Tyler yesterday talking about Mick Jagger and Tom Hanks doing CBD, and it's like, it's going to take over the world and take its rightful place. We all know it. They demonized it for 80 years for the cotton and for everything else. Pharmaceutical companies didn't want it because it healed people. The doctors didn't have a clue and they were pharmaceutical reps. Everybody was bought off. It was a payoff. They tried to wipe it out. That's why they did 40 years of trying to wipe this out. It didn't work. The medicinal side, the tenacity of all these outlaws made it so it came over the top. There's no turning it back now. Cannabis heals people. It inspires them. It's a medicine, it's a joy, it's something that we deserve. It's a clothing source, it's a, they're going to make plastics out of it. It's, there's nothing we can't do and it doesn't take the toxic energy of other agriculture. It remediates, it loves us, it's part of the earth in a way that was a blessing for us and it's going to take over and do its thing. And the great part is it's touching the hearts and minds and souls of all the people that come into contact with it. Because like my uncle, they become more joyous and happy and inspired. They're not on pharmaceutical drugs with side effects, getting sick. They're not on alcohol. They're on cannabis and they're happy. And so we're going to bring that around the world and we're going to change the world dynamic. And, and I believe in five years we're going to end warfare and we're going to end all this. And they're going to look back and realize that cannabis was the leading cause of this. And then they're going to wonder, why did we fight it so hard? Why did these people be so vigilant? And I don't think they wanted it. So I think we're going to see a beautiful, beautiful world in five years. At the same time, we're going to have a very, very challenging moment for the people that built this industry. And so it's a double-edged sword for me. I'm really excited about where we're going, and I've got a real soft spot in my heart for, for the past.
it's just like everything in life, okay? People that make small products in other di different industries uh, are critical because they care more. It's small batch, they're putting light love into it, you know? When you get some giant you know, company making something, it's like, who cares? And then where's it coming from? What's going on? And stuff. So these small product makers that made all the tinctures and made the topicals and, and that made all the pre they're, they, they're putting their passion, their love into it. They're supporting more than just a giant corporation that's taking all the money home. They're, they're supporting the community. You know, every job, every three cannabis jobs then gives another job to some other ancillary industry like a gas station or a you know, clothing store or something else. So we need those small product makers, those small cultivators, those small businesses badly so that we hold our communities together and it doesn't come, become everybody working for $12 an hour at Walmart, you know, because that's not going to develop a culture. You know, you look back in the 70s and there was no debt and the average man could have, or woman, but mainly men working at the time, could have two kids and a wife at home and he could buy a house and he could take vacations and he had no debt. You are listening to Culture Interrupted. You gotta go back and look at history. Look at the moonshiners. They all thought that they'd hide in those hills of Virginia in the backwoods and they'd be okay. Well, about three years worth and they drug them behind cars, they hunted them down, they shot them, they brought the untouchables in, the FBI, and they wiped them out. They couldn't really deal with the cannabis people up here, especially in Humboldt and Trinity because they were buying off all the government people and the sheriffs and stuff. So it was a proliferating jumping business. Mendocino, they didn't get to do that. But what happened was, once you brought the fish and game in and the water boards, you couldn't buy those people off. It was like, you know, the Untouchables and Elliot Ness. Now you couldn't get to those people and they could get to those black market people. And you couple that with the fact that they used to have to go out with choppers, get, you know, get visuals, go back, get warrants, come out with teams and get this whole process. You can only get so many. Now they've got it where you got Google Map, 24 hour Google Map. They go on Google Map, they see where your crop is, they get uh, a warrant immediately, and what they do is they don't bring anybody out. They put a nice little thing on your, on your gate that says you're dealing with a ten dollars to $30,000 a day fine up to a million dollars until that crop's gone and they see it gone. And then they just got to look every day and they just keep charging you the fines. And you go down there and go to your tax place and you realize you got a $150,000 fine and it's still spinning. There's whole teams now that are eradication teams that aren't cops, they're real people getting paid to get the crops out so the fines go away. Brilliant move by the cops and all those guys. So they're knocking it out. This year, Gavin Newsom said he'd take it out and make the legal markets real and make them valuable, and he's doing that. You got National Guard over Trinity. You got people just bringing it down all over uh, Mendocino. And between those abatement notices and these people coming in heavy to wipe it out, uh, they're taking it out right now. And, uh, you know, just like the moonshiners 100 years ago, Three years, they were gone. It was over. People didn't do it. And it was just Jack Daniels and all the whiskeys and stuff. Well, what you're going to see here on the other side is that all these states across the country are all becoming legal very quickly. And so all of a sudden, Michigan's growing their own bud. Maine's growing their own bud. And you know, everybody says, oh, you want to get California bud. You do. You want to smoke some of that California bud. But if you're in Virginia and you've got a brewery that's making beers in Virginia, you want to support that brewery. And you rightfully should. They're making some homegrown brew nearby where you're at. And that's what's going to happen with cannabis. Every state in this country is coming online. Oklahoma, even that redneck state's opening it up and look what they're doing. And they're going to grow their own cannabis and it's going to take a lot of the need and the desire for the black market here anyway. So you're going to see both sides of that. Now, it'll pop back up in a couple years when things get lax, people go back and go into it. I hear indoors coming back big because the prices are so high. Now, one thing's happened is the prices, because they wiped out so much, they're skyrocketing. So now the prices for the black market, or we call a conventional market now, are rising rapidly. They're going up like $100 a week with all these busts. So people are looking at it and going, wow, you can get 22 to 2,500 pounds for indoor now. So they're firing up indoors. And people are selling more lights now, and people are going back to illegal indoor growing than ever before. So, you know, it's a cat and mouse game. We move around. People will still be ingenious on the conventional markets, and they'll do their growing. But at the size and stature of the millions of pounds a year that used to come out of the triangle, those days are gone, and they're never coming back. You are listening to Culture Interrupted. What we do at the Emerald Cup, when you come to the Emerald Cup, you see the culture. That's what people love to, coming to the Emerald Cup for, is because it was always uh, a show for the, for the cultivators and the product makers and the industry. And, and so it's really like the cultures as it was and as it was created in the Emerald Triangle is going to become like a museum piece. It's not going to really be there anymore in the same way. You're going to drive up and down these roads and you will see it at Emerald Farms, you'll see it at our place, you'll see it at, 
you know, the one log and elements of it, but the tr it's gonna, a lot of it's gonna be gone because you're not gonna have those 25,000 farmers up here anymore and stuff. So that part of the culture as we move out, uh, we wanna hold on to that. Uh, the way I look at it is we wanna take the Emerald Cup, we're taking it to England, we're gonna take it to LA, we're gonna take it around Canada. And we wanna bring that culture and show people what that culture is. And that culture is an alternative culture. It's the whole thing. It's a psychedelic, inspirational, peace and love, uh, non-violent, you know, let's figure out how to do things right. And it's so inspiring when you're around that. We've never had fights at the Emerald Cup. We've never had a fight here in 16 years at the Emerald Cup. The cannabis culture, cannabis people just tend to just, you know, live and let live, be chill, helping people out, just being nice, kind human beings. And uh, that culture is what we need a lot of in this country and in this world, you know, and that's what we gotta bring back. And I really believe this culture, which is being led by our spirit ally, is gonna help us and guide us back to that peaceful, inspirational way of living, being spiritual beings again. You know, and in conjunction with that, you're gonna see a huge thing with the psychedelics that's coming in. Looking at, you know, mushrooms now, psilocybin mushrooms being uh, legalized in Oregon, in, o in Oakland. It's gonna come all over because that's time to come back too. That's what we're gonna bring back, that's what we're gonna keep, that's what we're gonna bring that culture across the state and across the country, and that's what we're doing. And I'm really proud of that, and we need every one of these people that created this industry to stay, because unfortunately, the people in Salinas and Santa Barbara that are growing a lot of that cannabis now, they don't come from that culture and they don't understand it and that's not who they are and, and, you, and they're never gonna know that unless enough of us, enough of people like Kevin Jodry and Nikki and Swami, you know, me and Gene, you know, myself. There's so many of us, you know, that have gone out and they're part of that culture. You know, Steve D'Angelo, you know, no, the name's Dennis Hunter. Got busted three times, you know, and he's down there at Canacraft, you know. That's culture, those are outlaws, people that have been here that stood up, the Wild West and you know, uh, I'm proud of all those people, and that's what it's going to be. People are going to want to see that, just like they wanted to go to Tucson and feel that culture of the Wild West down there in Bisbee and Tucson and Phoenix and stuff, you know, and uh, because it's, it calls out to your soul. It's something that's real. You are listening to Culture Interrupted. I'd like to see the big corporate takeover of not only cannabis, but every aspect of society be knocked down. I didn't think we'd see it so quick with cannabis, and now you're already looking at Constellation and Coca-Cola and these huge companies. It's a double-edged sword. It's good because we don't need to be activists as much anymore because they're going to do it for us. They're going to make it all become legal because it's business. But at the same time, you know, what they're doing, with like, look at the CBD. You know, I want to see that dissolve immediately because what you got is under 0.3 THC, you can sell CBD across the country and all over the place. So you got all these people making these CBD products. They're not whole plant extract. They're not, uh, they're single molecule, single cannabinoids, and they're not, they're not really very good, okay? And they're giving us a bad name, they're not healing people. I work with the best medicine makers in the world because I've had so many illnesses, and I can tell you that, you know, you get, you know, a combination of cannabinoids uh, together in the right way that have been grown organically and processed right, and you're gonna heal. So we need to fix up this whole insanity of people making all this money off cheap CBD, you know, coming from hemp. That should just be wiped out. That's what I really wanna see, because I'm an evangelist for the medicinal side, and it's really hurt me to see such poor products going out just for money. You know, it's really disgusting. You are listening to Culture Interrupted. You know, as far as the hemp, uh, it's good because people are getting it, but then they're not getting the relief, they're not getting the, the real healing. And when you have true medicine that heals you, then you're like, wow, my arthritis did go away. My epilepsy did go away. I'm getting my brain regenerated. You know, my can you know, cancer is going away. And it's like, that's what people should have. We all deserve the real deal, the real medicine. With 0.3 uh, THC less, you can ship it any way you want. And so my friend was saying, you're seeing all this hemp that's being turned into CBD and all these large scale people doing it. There's no testing, there's no regulation. People are just making bank and they are. And uh, what you got is they're testing us where we're being tested at levels, restricted levels that no agricultural products have ever been tested at. And none of this is really being tested. Now, some of it around here is, but I mean, for the majority, this stuff's just sliding all over the country and the world, okay? And it's, they're gonna start testing all this and realize that just like we did when we started testing in the cup you know, several years ago, 50% of it was failing. I come from a very, very alternative nature of understanding the, you know, that plants talk to us, that we can talk to each other without any phones, that the telepathy all works, that we're all one, we're one part of God. And so to me, it's like, I don't make any decisions without the plant guiding me. 
it's never about money ever and it's always about the plant and her guiding me and telling me I can get high and go pull my cards or open up to visions and psychic dreams and I get just as great as information as when I'm meditating and I'm opening up afterwards because th that plant is so magical and so brilliant. She has a mind of her own and she's guiding us and sh she's in charge, not us. So I just realized that I'm just following her path and doing what she wants to do. You are listening to Culture Interrupted. It's always a, an eternal gratitude to the media and the journalists and the people that have really helped the activists and the outlaws create this world that we're in. So that's like, you know, the bottom of my heart, we've done it together. We're a team, all of us. And uh, it's about trust and education. You know, we've got to educate them. We went to nine VCC uh, meetings before they'd even put events on the agenda. They didn't even know what events were. And so I've spent my last 15 years educating people to cannabis and trying to get them to understand. They're still looking at us like they can't trust us like they've got to restrict us. They can't let us make products at home. They've got to weigh every gram. We did a depo crop and we found out that we have to take 3,000 plants and individually weigh them, keep them separated, trim them up, and keep the shake separated. Could you imagine doing that with apples or with a vineyard or anything? Do you know the time and energy and money that's costing us because of a lack of trust? And it's like, you know what? We need to make this industry grow. California is one of the most regulated, restricted industries and, or you know, states in the country. As good as we are, we have such overregulation that we've got to open it up and have some trust and some faith and let this plant fly. Let us fly. Let the economy go because then we can grow faster and we can have more impact and we can really make a difference. Not for 10 years, we can make it in one or two. We can heal the world. We can open up these medicinal products, these clinical test trials that are just coming out. We, every person should be on a cannabis combination of cannabinoids daily and we could get rid of the disease. Are we going to thrive? Are we going to stand up to the doctors and the pharmaceutical companies and the political powers that be as a humanity? Or are we going to let them continue to make our families and our loved ones sick and die while they suck us dry and don't give us a fair wage and don't share the wealth of this world? They went to the University of Mississippi 40, 60, 80 years ago and started studying cannabis. They knew 20 years before the Israelis that it was medicinal and healed people. Our government and our people have known all this. Why didn't they give it to us? There's going to be a reckoning because they're going to have to stand up and tell us why they didn't because they didn't want us to thrive. Do we want us to thrive? Give us a chance. Stop toxifying us with all the pollution, the vaccines, the chemtrails, the water, the food. Don't allow people to make food that kills our kids. Why is that allowed? Those people should be in prison for crimes against humanity, and yet you're going to go pick on the cannabis people. It's like, let's realize that we're all one team, and that we have to realize that we've been duped, and the people that have been running this place, Democrats, Republicans, all of them, have been torturing and enslaving and, and killing us off. And it's time for it to end. And cannabis is going to be the vehicle that does it because it's going to unite us and it's going to come across and the people that are in cannabis, put, the reason why they hated all of us is because we take our money and we funded Greenpeace. We fund liberal politicians. We bring cops up here to talk so we can come together. We funded the alternative part of this world and that's why a lot of these alternative things have come about. Okay? And if we just keep going with it across the country, we'll get rid of all the people that want to think that it's okay to hurt our families and the earth. I used to read three, four newspapers a day, magazines. I mean, I, I, I just assimilate knowledge. And uh, I know everything they've done. I've watched it all. And it's a crime, all of them. I'll tell you what, I've said anybody above 50 should be taken out of politics because they've all been bought off. Democrats, Republicans, every one of them. How could they have allowed this? How, how could they have allowed this? You know, and it's just they sold out. For control and greed. For control and greed. And it's like, you, you talk about these... You know, how many people die in this war and that war? How many millions? And my mom, my family, my sisters, my uncle, they didn't just, and the pain and suffering they've lived on the way out. You know, it's like, it's, it's a crime against humanity. And they should all be put up on charges. I mean, every pharmaceutical head of every company, look at the opiate crisis and what they've done. And what they've, and they, the lack, they pay for the research so they can bring their goddamn pills on top of us. They, they phony all the scientific things. They own everything. They own the justice departments. They own everything. That's how Epstein got away with that crap. That's how all these people have got away with that crap. And the reckoning is coming. They had their time. It's like 
they tried to kill the cannabis thing, but the root just got bigger and bigger. They tried to kill the psychedelic nature of the 60s, the root got bigger and bigger. They tried to suppress us, and they finally just, we just burst out. And now it's like with this new spiritual age that we're coming into, we're not gonna allow this. People are over it. I mean, we're gonna look back and think, why did we allow them to do that to us? There's more of us. When we brought Tom Allman up, we brought Tom up and we demanded the sheriffs come up here and they came up here because we said, you know what? There's more of us than you. If you don't do what we say, we're gonna vote you out. Well, why didn't we do that with all these crooks? We've allowed them all to come in here and do this. You are listening to Culture Interrupted. In the next five years, I'm so excited about the next five years. I just want to live for them. Uh, cannabis is a small part of that now. It's done its job. Now we're going to move into psychedelics. We're going to move into small free energy. We're going to move into stem cells. We're going to move into space. And that's why Bezos, that's why Musk, that's why all those billionaires want to get there as fast as they can because they know we're already there. We just haven't been told. We're already all over the place. We just haven't been told. They already got free energy systems. Anybody goes and studies it, they're easy to find out. So the 28 patents that they've, snookered and taken away from us for free energy machines, they're going to deliver free energy machines. If you study stem cell research, if you look at stem cell research, which they demonized, okay, they're now proving that you can take the cartilage behind the knee that will not regenerate. It's the only part of the body that won't regenerate. They're regenerating with stem cells. They can take stem cells and they used to have to take it out of your bone marrow. They can take it out of your fat cells and they can take as much as a person needs and they can keep you in perfect health for probably 200 years. They didn't want us to have it because how are they gonna give us pharmaceuticals and toxify us and make the medical thing work and the funeral homes and suck us dry and spit us out so the next one could come in. And it's like, so we're gonna have stem cells come in and we're gonna be able to live for indefinite periods of time and great health. We're gonna have free energy come in because we've already had it for all these years. They just bought it out. Our space family is ready to come in. Trump formed the Space Force and they laughed at him. I didn't vote for Trump or Hillary Clinton. He formed, they laughed at him, then he formed the Space Command, which not many people have heard about, and put all the armed forces under the Space Command because they were doing so much in space because they know it. We've been doing this for the last 50 years. We never stopped. They just didn't give it to us. So we're going to acknowledge space. Think about it. We could manufacture all of our needs in space on asteroids or planets and turn this place into a park, which it's supposed to be. The Earth's a park. It's not an industrial park. It's a paradise, the Garden of Eden. And so we can turn this into the Garden of Eden and do our manufacturing offshore, but this time it's in planets and asteroids. We can get rid of that as long as we let these people that have rolled the world, they gotta just go with it. They gotta go out of here too, we'll send them off. And then we're gonna have healed, healthy people that have free energy. Food is 40% efficient now. They're proving they can make enough food so there's no reason for any poverty. You t what do people fight about? You give them clean water, food, and energy, and then they can hang out. You know, the people of California, this state, the, historically, the indigenous Native Americans were one of the only tribes of sets of people. They had a lot of tribes that did very little fighting. You know why? It wasn't like the Plains or some of the Midwest or the rest of that stuff out there. California had the bounty. It had all the fish, all the, all the animals, all the food. They weren't fighting over anything. They were partying and having a great time traveling up and down this coast. That's why California has always had that mentality, that, that psychic spiritual energy. That's why you've got Silicon Valley. Look at all the music scene. You look at the cannabis, because this historically, karmically, is like a heart chakra for California, and it's, it's going to come back and continue to do that. But what we're about to go into is a, a period of time that's going to be the greatest period of time in the last 10 or 15,000 years. And uh, I just hope to live to see that, that promised day, because it's coming. And uh, I really, uh, for my grandkids and my, my family and everybody in the world, it's, it's going to be the greatest thing on earth. But you know what? You have to fight for it. It's not going to just be, just going to be that they're not going easy. These people aren't going to go easy. So we have to demand it. We have to educate people. We have to fight for the rest of the legalization of cannabis, for psychedelics. We have to get rid of the demonization of telepathy and psychic behavior and, and mediums and stuff. I've been representing them my whole life. And people are afraid to go to them because they said that they're demonized. Well, go read Phenomena. Annie Jacobs' book, Pulitzer Prize winner, okay? It talks about how they were, 30 years before Carlos Constanada, our government, the CIA, was down there pulling the mushrooms out and trying to figure out how people were psychic and what they were getting out of it all, all then. It's already in a book and a Pulitzer Prize with Annie Jacobson. All this stuff, they didn't tell us any of it. We need to really know the true story, and it's not going to be something you're ever going to think our government was good, because they haven't been. 
There were a bunch of crooks and smucks, all sides, Democrats, Republicans, and they took over this country about, eight, about 100 years ago, actually, when, when George Bush Sr. came in. They created the Federal Reserve. They crashed the economy, and they basically, that's when they took over. You know, that was the beginning of it. You go back and you want to learn the truth, it's there. You are listening to Culture Interrupted. It's kind of like when hip-hop and rap came in. As soon as you opened up the recording mic to, to minorities and to people that didn't have the, the chance, then they showed you what they could do. You know, they rocked it, okay? And it's like, you look at it, it's like, let's, let's educate everybody. Let's give them all a chance because then we can dream up things that are like incredible. And let's open up how much the mind can do rather than suppress it. Let's start talking about psychic nature. And how is it that all of a sudden you think about somebody and they call you? And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you think about a song and it comes on or these things. Those, those things are all there. They've always been there. This giant energetic web of God and creativity that connects us together and it's all inspiration. But, you know, I realized, uh, I was thinking about what sin is. And uh, for me anyway, uh, sin is anything that keeps the direct connection to God. Because God is trying to inspire you and teach you through the angels and guides. And if you're shutting that down, whatever that is is sin because you're not doing it. I'm an addictive personality. I, uh, my family are all alcoholics. I tried to snort my way through cocaine after my dad committed suicide. I, I understand addiction. Uh, I got addicted to meditation and all good things. That's why I've lived through all these things. I'm addicted to health. I'm addicted to cannabis. I love cannabis. People say you can smoke as much cannabis as you want. It's not addictive. Anything is addictive. Sex, food, money. It doesn't matter what it is. Anything that you're, as is is an addict, you're addicted to. I love cannabis. Man, I love it. I love to get high. I smoke 10 joints a day until I couldn't smoke anymore. I had to vaporize. You know, I'm like, you know, fatties in my mouth all day long. I'm hyperactive, you know, got a lot of energy, so it didn't ever slow me down. I could do it. I'm 62. Uh, when I smoke now, because I'm doing so much, I can't get up uh, at 5 o'clock and go till 11 o'clock. I mean, I go till 11 o'clock, I get up at 5 o'clock. I sleep on six hours a night. I work like a mad dog, and I'm 62. I've had a lot of illnesses. I'm worn down. My battery's about 60%. And so when I smoke, I can't get up at 5 in the morning. I get up at 7. And I miss a lot of interaction with people on social media, and I don't connect with all my friends, and, and uh, I don't meditate as clearly, and I don't have like lucid dreams, and my writing really goes downhill because I, I have too many other things, and I've started off slow, so I've got to get to that, and I write ma magnificently when I'm not, and so for me, I keep fighting back and forth. I've, I've had to quit cannabis again uh, because it, it. I use it in an addictive nature, and I, it keeps me from that direct connection to God. So my meditations and my channeled stream of consciousness writing and my dream, because that's where you connect with your angels and your guides and God really well in your dreams. Shamans have known that forever. It isn't there. So I'm not saying cannabis is bad for anybody. In fact, you know, most people need it in some way uh, because it balances them. And I think everybody needs it in some way medicinally, for sure. Everything has its time and place. And for me, at this point, uh, my complete sobriety and my clarity is my direct connection to God. And so for me, it's, it's an adverse situation, interaction with God to get high. And that's really interesting because I'm the cannabis guy and I love cannabis and I'm the, you know, there was the marijuana man and I've got the, uh, the Emerald Cup. And I'm not saying cannabis is, like I said, bad for anybody. It's just, I'll get back to it at this point in my life. Uh, I've got to finish some books. I've got to evangelize, I've got to educate, I've got to go around the world. And you know what? I like to stay home and hang out with my dogs and get high. And uh, I, don't, I don't speak as much or go out and it's like, hey, I don't get high and want to go out and speak in the, in the public like that. Uh, so uh, the world needs me and I, I've got to be clear. We appreciate you making the time to listen to Culture Interrupted.